I have the honor of serving on the Skoll Foundation Board, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you here today, Dr. Ngozi okonjo in your role as Director General of the World Trade Organization. Welcome and hello. Thank you. You happen to sit in an unenviable position at a time of unprecedented global disruptions in the global trade system. You stepped into your role in the midst of, an un, you know, of a historic pandemic, and the disruptions to the trade system have continued with conflicts around the world, most recently uh, that currently ravaging Ukraine. How do you think about the role of the World Trade Organization and the global trade system in protecting the most vulnerable from the ravages of these disruptions? Well, th thank you very much. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, this is an unprecedented time. First, we had the disruptions arising from the pandemic and the snafus with the uh, uh, global supply chains of so many products that uh, has been leading to delays in getting products, rise in prices, uh, uh, inaccessibility even for small and medium enterprises and for poorer countries to global supply chains. Uh, so that had already been difficult. Inflationary pressures arising from all of this in many countries around the world. And, and then you, you layer onto that just what you said, the crisis of the war in Ukraine uh, has added onto these disruptions. Because you now have rising energy prices and rising food prices. And you know that in the, in the, in the budgets of many households, the two biggest items are both energy prices and food prices. So uh, this, this crisis will be hitting, yes, we, we should all be very mindful that Ukraine is bearing the brunt of what is happening now. And uh, it's a heart-wrenching situation. Uh, we hope that there'll be peace very soon and we should all rally around the people of Ukraine. Uh, but we also, you've pointed to a very important issue, which is that these disruptions in supply chains will be hitting or are hitting very vulnerable countries and vulnerable populations within these countries. Now, you know, we are also noticing some phenomena related to trade, and this is where the trade and the WTO can be uh, quite uh, uh, instrumental and supportive. First of all, the biggest antidote to helping vulnerable populations right now is keeping the multilateral trading system open and trading and level and keeping supply chains open. Many people don't think about trade this way, but trade is actually an instrument for resilience. So when you have supplies cut out from one part of the world, you, trade makes it possible to take supplies from another part of the world to where they are needed. So we, uh, the role we can play now is to make sure our rules are in place <clears throat> that the, the, the level playing field for the trading system is respected. So we are trying to work on that and ensure that monitoring supply chains so that they stay open, both for inputs and outputs, uh, the food and the energy supplies that countries need. You have written and spoken often about um, the, the, you know, what the COVID-19 pandemic revealed about the inequities of, uh, of, of, of global health. As we speak now, the rich world largely seems to be putting the worst of this pandemic behind us. In other parts of the world, Africa and elsewhere, we are seeing a respite and we're hoping for the best, but vaccination uh, rates and access to health commodities are uneven around the world. As we reflect on COVID-19 and also prepare for future pandemics, drawing on your own experience, not just in this role, but as former chair of Gavi, as a, as a former minister and a, and, a, and a public servant in a range of roles, what needs to be done to ensure a more equitable global response to future challenges to global health? Well, thank you. That is actually a critical question. And what I want to say is that we mustn't forget that the crisis of the pandemic is still on. I mean, yes, we are rightly focusing on the war in Ukraine now, the, the, the really terrible situation there, but the pandemic is still another war that, that um, we are facing. First of all, let me say that in this pandemic, there are one or two things that I'm actually quite uh, proud that we've been able to do at the WTO, whilst, and that the trading system has been able to do. Whilst overall trade contracted uh, in 2020, for instance, uh, we, we, saw that, we saw that trade in medical supplies and goods actually increased by 16% in value. What does this mean? It means that the trading system helped to take goods 
again, from where they were made to places where they were needed. Hence the increase in the value of, of goods traded. And that meant that the trading system was part of the resilience and response system. Secondly, um, many WTO members had actually put in export restrictions on inputs and outputs related to the pandemic. When I first took the job uh, uh, in March last year, there were about 119 export restrictions and prohibitions. I can tell you today we are down to 35. And a great effort has been made by WTO members to bring this down. Finally, let me just touch on the issue of decentralized manufacturing of vaccines. Because what we noticed during this pandemic is that the manufacturing and export of vaccines is highly concentrated. 80% of the world's export of vaccines comes from 10 countries. And what we've tried to do here is work with the CEO, C CEOs of vaccine manufacturers, the, the top 10 worldwide, to encourage them. If we are working with them on their supply chains, perhaps they could invest in decentralized manufacturing capacity. This is happening in Africa. As you know, African presidents have also been quite forthcoming and you know really proud of what they've done to try and attract these investments to the continent. So that's something that we've been actively uh, pushing from behind. Lastly, intellectual property. I think everyone knows that there's been a very, very strong uh, um, uh, negotiations, debate going on here at the WTO about the waiver of intellectual property so that poorer countries can manufacture, have access to the patent. This is something for the past three months that with this, my staff here, we've been trying to work on quietly behind the scenes to get four key countries to see if they could come up with some ideas that other members could look at. And that has happened now. We need to take it to the entire membership. We need even those countries to confirm that their governments are behind this. Then we take it to the entire membership and then hopefully we'll have an IP framework that will work, not just for this pandemic, but for the next one. Indeed. As we think about tackling big global challenges, none looms larger than the challenge of human-caused climate change. Uh, you have talked about the, the, the reality, and we all know that the poorest countries, including you know, countries in Africa, where we are both from, have done the least to cause it and are feeling the biggest brunt. And yet you've taken a different view in some of your writings that really spoke to me which is that Africa, in addition to being, of course, a major vulnerable and affected part of the world from a, from a climate perspective, could have a leading role to play in leading a climate response. How do you see that playing out? And what, what, how might that play out through the global trading system and other parts of the global system to shift Africa's role from climate victim to potentially climate vanguard? Yes, I, I strongly believe in looking for opportunities within, within challenges. And I see the challenge of climate change, which is probably one of the most existential challenges we face today, uh, an opportunity for the continent. Uh, I know it sounds strange because as of 2021, we contributed 4% to global carbon emissions, which is very low. But if you look at the incidence of weather-based disasters and, and the climate change challenges, droughts, floods, the con continent has, is really clearly in the eye of the storm on this issue. And that affects food availability and the land and all sorts of things. So, so one could take that kind of a lens to it. But I prefer to look at it a bit differently and say, you know, if you look by many estimates, two thirds of the continent's infrastructure is yet to be built. We know that a significant percentage of people on the continent have no access to electricity. This presents an opportunity, electricity, roads, ports, so many pieces of infrastructure are not there. What does that mean? Rather than replicating the infrastructure with the same mistakes that have been made by the rich countries, we could be a leader in trying to put in place new infrastructure with low carbon emission uh, uh, potential. So we, we are good for solar, we are good for wind on the continent. And I'm actually proud to say the largest solar farm today is in Morocco. We also have some of the more preserved forests in the world, in the Congo and the other parts. We, can, we are also a carbon sink. People talk of the Amazon, they forget that we have a potential to be a, carbon, a good carbon sink. But for all of these things to happen, we need incentives. We need that $100 billion a year promised by the developed countries to materialize, you know, so we can invest. And this is a question of trust. So the rich countries must make good on this and they must support us for a just transition. 
to a low carbon development pathway. Stirring indeed. As in closing, you have been, you have held a range of firsts throughout your career the first woman or the first African or both in a range of roles uh, in Nigeria and beyond. Any reflections from you to the school community on how we can think about continuing to build a more diverse leadership and a more inclusive leadership for the world? Well, uh, thank you. Uh, it's very sobering, actually, when you think about this series of firsts. I just want to say it doesn't really make me happy to be the first this, the first woman this, because it means we are not making progress in this day and age. I will be much happier when I'm not described as the first to do this and the first to do that. Um, you know, and people often ask what has been my experience. I think the, the, the lesson I've learned is that focusing on my strengths, where I have uh, on jobs that I'm actually, I actually enjoy doing, uh, uh, you know, I'm focusing on that and I'm someone who is happiest when I feel I'm doing a job that is serving others. So my entire, entire career has been built on policy at the large level. That's what I like. How can I make change in a bigger way, either at home through policy making as I was in finance and foreign affairs or in international organizations where you can affect policy that changes the lives of so many. Imagine the multilateral trading system, if you could make that work better for poor people and poor countries, that's huge. So my, the lessons learned is focus if you, on what you uh, like to do, train for it, and then try to seek jobs there that, uh, that, that really make you want to get up in the morning and go to work. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, uh, you know, chances are you will be able to make progress. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I want to say that if women are to make progress, men must also learn to open the way. Men play a critical role in whether women make progress or not. And I often advise women, if you're looking, seeking mentors, don't only look to other women, also look to men. As at now, they are controlling a lot of the places where women cannot get into. And I want them to hear this message. You need to get out of the way a little bit so that women can have a chance. <laughs> Heard very loud and clear. Dr. Okonjoela, thank you so much for taking this time to speak to the school community during what must be a hectically busy time. Uh, and we appreciate your time with us today and all of your wise words. Thank you very much, James. Thank you. And thanks to the school community. Thank you for what you're doing to support the world and make it a better place. <laughs>